Okay, we want to begin our first panel. Perfect. Okay. I want to introduce our... Oh, there's Jason. Oh, come on down. <laughs> I want to introduce the moderator is Beth Waterfall, and she is with... Hello. Uh, Elevate Northeast, and I'm going to turn it over to Beth. Thank you, Rick. Figured I'd take the podium, we can social distance a little bit. <laughs> Thanks everybody for coming out. Uh, like Rick said, my name is Beth Waterfall. I'm the executive director of Elevate Northeast, which is a 501c3 based here in Massachusetts. And we endeavor to break stigma and make people just less afraid of cannabis, less afraid of the people who work with it, less afraid of the people who consume it. Um, so we encourage you to visit elevatene.org and get to know us and get involved. Hey, Taylor. <laughs> Um, I'm also a marketing consultant. I'm working exclusively in the cannabis industry, and I'm lucky to be joined by one of my clients, Garden Remedies, Brian, Brian Moran here. So we'll start introducing our panel here, and we'll kick off with Brian. Brian, tell us a little bit about yourself and what you're doing here. Hi, everyone. Um, Rick, thanks for the, uh, for the invite. And um, sure, my name's Brian Moran. I'm uh, co-CEO and CFO of Garden Remedies. Uh, Garden Remedies, we are a vertically integrated cannabis company. We were started in 2013, and we're solely in Massachusetts right now. Um, our, we were founded by Dr. Karen Min Casey, who's an anesthesiologist, and she saw a lot of troubles with uh, pain management, things of that nature. She also had horrific breast cancer and had to kind of fight her way through that and saw a lot of opportunities for people to utilize cannabis for better positive outcomes when she saw that. So she founded Garden Remedies, and in 2016, we were one of the original medical uh, marijuana companies in the state. Uh, in 2018, when legalization occurred of adult use, uh, we were the second store. Our Newton store was the second store inside of 495 Beltway that was open. Um, and we're now at the point where we have three uh, stores in Massachusetts, which is the maximum, uh, according to the cannabis rules, uh, a store in Newton, uh, a store in, uh, the only store in Melrose, and a store in Marlboro. And we also have our grow facility in Fitchburg. It's an 85,000 square foot warehouse um, where we, we have 11 grow rooms and produce all of our products. We also have a big extraction lab, a C1, I think it is. Um, all of our packaging, all of our processing. So we basically make everything. You can see pictures of our products over with Ben and the team over there. And uh, yeah, so my focus in coming here is talking to people similar to what Beth said about cannabis, about investing in cannabis or potentially developing in cannabis and hopefully to help people understand how it works. Thank you, Brian. And to my right, my new friend, Jason Peak from Genetech. Jason, tell us a little bit about you and Genetech. Sure. I'm Jason Peake. I represent Genetech in the Northeast, uh, specifically in what we call the signature brand verticals, and medical marijuana happens to fall under that. Uh, essentially, we are a software-based platform. Uh, we make no hardware, so we utilize uh, open platform hardware to secure these types of facilities, all the way from video management, access control, even capturing license plates on the outside of facilities, right, protecting them from intrusion. And then on the inside, whether it be having a visitor come in, uh, register or pre-register, and then keeping that compliance of, uh, you know, where did this batch of uh, plants go and where did it go through the facility, um, even monitoring building automation alarms and integrating, you know, third-party uh, third systems to uh, bring intelligence to the operator. Um, so with that being said, um, that's, that's what happens on the local level, but as we know, these cannabis companies are growing rapidly, many different locations, many different states, different regulatory requirements in every one of them, and we, you know, help uh, maintain those requirements uh, across the globe, um, not just nationally. So, Genetech is a uh, Canadian-based company um, just above the border in Montreal, and um, here to, you know, help you guys with anything you want to learn with the technology side of protecting the uh, facilities. Thank you, Jason. And let's go to our guests joining us from the interwebs. Let's start with my friend, Kristen Jordan. Good morning, Kristen. How are you? Hi, Beth. So nice to be with you. Thank you so much for having us, Rick. Really appreciate this conversation. Uh, I'm actually coming to you from the Rainbow Room here in New York City at another conference. Um, so happy to be uh, able to, to share with you guys uh, 
this morning. Uh, I am the founder of an eponymous uh, real estate brokerage firm called Park Jordan. Uh, we just uh, announced our unveiling recently. Uh, I am a lawyer, a real estate broker in the space. I'm also an advocate. I've been part of the social justice and uh, uh, legalization efforts here in New York uh, for the last, I think, seven, eight years. I was reminded this morning that uh, it's been a long journey, uh, but uh, here we are, the, the precipice of legalization here in New York. But uh, my special niche uh, that I've um, tried to carve out here in New York is as a real estate broker. Uh, I manage, most recently, I managed the real estate portfolio for Acres Holdings, one of the largest uh, uh, multi state operators. And in that role, I oversaw um, at its peak a portfolio of, uh, I think it was uh, upwards of 85 leases, and managed that strategic uh, uh, rollout uh, among our, our various uh, footprint. Thank you, Kristen. And then finally joining us uh, virtually is Raymond Castronovo, who's a construction attorney with Fricelli Deegan Tirana. Raymond, tell us a little bit about yourself. Welcome. Hey, uh, good morning. Thanks for having me. Um, yes, I'm an attorney uh, with the construction law group and also the cannabis law group of the law firm Fricelli Deegan Tirana. I've been with the firm uh, about nine years. And um, as the, uh, the growing uh, legalization of cannabis in New York and the New England area, uh, we've seen a big overlap between our construction practice and our cannabis practice. Uh, we routinely uh, do a land use and zoning assessment of sites, uh, review leases for cannabis facilities, um, and, and purchase agreements uh, with cannabis facilities. So I'm excited here to talk to you a little bit about the legal aspects and some of the regulations uh, that we've seen uh, come to light. Thank you, Raymond. And we're going to probably say enter that word regulations um, in addition to the word compliance a lot today because there's so much to think about. And before we jump in, um, I'm just curious. I met a couple gentlemen or a few gentlemen this morning, and this was their first time coming to a cannabis-related event. If you're not shy, who else is in that boat? This is your first time coming to a cannabis-related event. Awesome. Welcome. Welcome. Um, I know it can be a little weird, right? <laughs> um, but I assure you, you're in good company and, um, you know, opportunity abounds, uh, particularly with the right uh, partnerships and, of course, abiding by regulations and being compliant in all ways. Um, so welcome. And, of course, the folks who are, are OG people, welcome as well. And thanks again to Rick and the Journal for having us. Um, so I want to start, let's go right back to Raymond, the lawyer. <laughs> uh, who regulates cannabis facilities? And I, I think that's one of the uh, most important uh, things to consider when looking for or assessing a cannabis facility uh, is to understand sort of the sources of the laws and, and who really has jurisdiction and authority to regulate uh, cannabis. And in, in that regard, I, I think um, it's important to consult with an attorney uh, when considering an investment uh, or purchasing a uh, cannabis facility or operation. There, uh, The laws right now are kind of all over the place. There's a lot of different sources um, of regulations and laws uh, that govern cannabis facilities, grow facilities, retail facilities. And, you know, it's very important, I think, to have an attorney take a close look at that. Um, and and it'll be, they'll have to be specific to the jurisdiction where the location would be uh, located because um, it varies, you know, from New York to Massachusetts to Vermont. There are different regulatory bodies that have been created by the state law and, and local laws that it will be specific, but they're, they're generally uh, pretty similar throughout the New England area. Um, first off, you'll have a state um, legislation that'll generally authorize and allow for the development and operation of a cannabis facility. Um, and the general state law will create the, sort of a framework now that the local municipalities and townships and cities um, can develop more specific legislation to pinpoint uh, issues that may come up more locally regarding development, operation, and use of cannabis facilities. Um, and so those regulations on the more local level can come from the health department, uh, local townships, um, the building department. Um, here in New York, they've created, and it's passed fairly recently, the uh, MRTA, the Marijuana Regulation and Taxation Act, uh, which created a, um, a governmental body, uh, two governmental bodies, the Office of Cannabis Management and the Cannabis Control Board, that are still in the early stages of implementing regulations, but many uh, states and jurisdictions will have 
similar boards that'll deal with the licensing, uh, enforcement, and oversight of cannabis facilities. Um, and then aside from that, um, I think I had mentioned that the health departments, uh, the building departments will also have specific uh, codes and regulations for the construction of the facilities that'll include specifications for types of HVAC systems um, and circulation for uh, on-site use uh, facilities. Um, so I think the, the moral of the, the question is that, you know, the, these laws do come from a lot of different sources and it's, it's very important, I think, before making an investment and getting into the, um, the construction, use, uh, or operation of a cannabis facility that um, the, the investor has a good understanding of what the different laws are and, and where, um, you know, where there may be issues down the, few, down the road. For sure. Raymond, thank you for that. And of course, in Massachusetts, we have the Cannabis Control Commission. Um, encourage everybody to get very familiar with the, the commissions, uh, the regulations that are posted on the commission's website. And there's other guidance documents on there um, as well. And also the commission is, is very open. If you have questions or suggestions, um, they're collaborative in that sense. They want to hear from people because we're still building that rocket ship while we're going into orbit. <laughs> um, so Thank you for that, Raymond, as far as the regulations go. But Kristen, I want to move it over to you to talk. Of course, we have to understand the regulations and how to be compliant. But what are some of the other challenges that come into play um, when just selecting a, a site to build a cannabis facility? Yeah, Beth. Uh, so as you alluded to, there are many challenges in, ter in terms of site selection. Uh, so for instance, in a, a state like Massachusetts, where you've had uh, a program for a couple of years at this point, uh, you know, all of the retail opportunities have been cherry picked. And so latecomers to the game are now having to source uh, alternative sites that perhaps are not uh, main and main and are not, uh, you know, your high, high street traffic uh, retail opportunities. But uh, you know, as a result of, of uh, activity and, and uh, zoning uh, rules and regs, uh, there are not the premium sites uh, available anymore. Uh, here in New York and New Jersey, we're still waiting for our regulation. So while there's a lot of activity and market search and, and um, research uh, being conducted, uh, folks are real reluctant to pull the trigger. I mean, we saw under uh, uh, the medical uh, expansion a proposed medical expansion in New Jersey that uh, now we have operators or potential operators who are holding lease, uh, leases for upwards of three years at this point. Uh, so there's a lot of cautious uh, uh, optimism about what we can do and seeing uh, the rollout of uh, adult use for both New York and New Jersey. And, and quite frankly, Connecticut, uh, while it's a much smaller market, uh, it has potential to uh, get their regulations and their program up and running a lot sooner than the, the larger states. Um, I think one of the, the reasons why we're seeing such um, trepidation around securing real estate uh, immediately is not only because we have more savvy players in the market and folks understand the regulatory process and understand that, uh, you know, lawsuits can upend uh, programs and stall uh, indefinitely. Um, so we have those savvier folks who understand this process a little bit better. I think also uh, the uh, proposed bill or the bills in the proposed regulations in New York and New Jersey are much more progressive than we've seen in any other state. And so the goals uh, towards uh, social justice and economic um, uh, equality um, mandate that, uh, you know, we have certain uh, regulations that will enable and foster uh, small businesses and, and uh, um, entrepreneurs who have been impacted by uh, racially biased uh, enforcement of, of uh, drug prohibition um, we're seeing those folks uh, uh, with real opportunities uh, under this new, this new bill and the, the proposed program. Uh, we just are not quite sure how it's going to roll out and in, whether it is going to be a phased approach. Um, we're just not sure. And so there's a lot of reluctance around uh, securing those sites. But, you know, we've seen in nearly every municipality uh, that I'm aware of uh, that securing real estate is a prerequisite to uh, licensing or to ap the application process. Um, and, you know, in the majority of scenarios that I've worked in, uh, it stops just short of signing a lease, uh, especially in the retail scenario. And an LOI is typically, a letter of intent is typically sufficient for the application process. Um, some other challenges that we have, of course, is that you know, we are still uh, uh, engaged in a federally prohibited uh, business. And so you have uh, considerations that the landlords have uh, financing on their buildings and underlying mortgages for which uh, the lenders are not 
amenable to taking on uh, uh, cannabis clients. And my concern there is that, uh, you know, while LOIs, letters of intent, are the only uh, required uh, documentation for an application, my concern is that uh, the landlords and the brokers who are negotiating these deals are not necessarily going to their lender because they don't need lender approval to, to consummate an LOI. And so the concern, of course, is that, uh, you know, the uh, uh, clients have secured uh, the, the real estate under an LOI. And then uh, once they win their application and their license, they have, I believe it's 30 days in New York. I forget what the, the time period is in New Jersey, but I would assume it's something similar. Um, and so within that 30 day period, they must secure that real estate with a lease. And you know, if and when a lender appears and did not know that there was an LOI for a cannabis tenant, that could happen the the deal entirely. And you know, everything is in motion at that point. And securing an additional site in lieu of that that location would be very problematic for us. It could put it in jeopardy. So, uh, you know, those are just some of the high level considerations uh, that we think about on behalf of our clients. Chris. Brian, was there something you wanted to add to that? Yeah, I would say, Kristen, you hit the nail on the head. I think for you, for anyone looking to invest in real estate or invest in these companies, there are a couple of things you want to think about. The first one is every one of these Northeast states is, other than Massachusetts and Maine, every one of them is still pre-rollout, right? So New Jersey is probably the furthest along. But even New Jersey, which I think today they were supposed to have an open source meeting because they already missed some deadlines associated with their process. So they were supposed to actually have a meeting today, a conference today to lay out the new timeline. And they already delayed that today's conference till mid-October. So what you're going to see in a lot of these states, and it happened in Massachusetts, it happened, as Kristen said, in New Jersey with the previous medical, they call them the 2019s, um, it's going to take time. So you've got to be smart about locking up the right real estate at the right time. And then the other part to it, as Kristen said, is most states, if not all of them, it's the license goes to the, loca the location. So if you lose out on that location, your license is gone. You have to actually, in most states, I think even in Massachusetts, you have to operate at your licensed location for at least a year before you can even, I think, before you can even transfer your license to another location. I think there's some rules associated with it. Same, similar with like what they call tier expansions, where you, your cultivation is, can only be a certain size. You have to show that you can sell all of that before you can apply to the commission to grow it larger. And so what you want to do is find the right partner that understands, uh, that, that you can work with. And I think social equity is the key to cannabis in the future. We're very, very focused on working with social equity groups in Massachusetts and outside of Massachusetts. And it's groups that usually don't have the credit that landlords look for. But these groups are gonna have priority access. Lots of states are putting together, are starting to put together funding programs. And it is legislated. Like in New York, it's so aggressive that in theory, after they have what's called a two year look back period. So they'll have two years of operations and again, they haven't done the regs, so it's not figured out yet. But in theory, after those two years will look and they'll say how much of the cultivation came from social equity companies, how much came from non-social equity companies. If there was more than 50% coming from non-social equity companies, the state of New York, the regulators can take away canopy from non-social equity players to align the market and make it in parity. So my view, and a lot of people, is the only way that's going to happen is if major social equity is opened in New York very early on. Because most cases, a new state, what happens is you have a medical program. So you have large medical pro players in the state already uh, providing to, pro to people. That's what's happening in all of the Northeast states right now. And then as adult use comes along, those guys start to build and build and build and build and build while it's still under a medical program. And then as soon as adult use go, all these meds are able to transfer and be adult use. So they're first to market with all of the canopy that's already been operated. When that market opens, that's when other groups can start building almost, or other groups can start getting to the point where they can start building. So these medical players get a multi-year head start. And so New York is trying to figure out a way to not do that. And the way that's going to happen is by getting social equity up and running earlier. So my view, and I would suggest to you guys, it's probably more of a 
quote unquote risky investment to look at it, but I think social equity is going to be key to the growth of the cannabis industry. And I think it's a way that if you embrace it, it's going to be uh, a way that you can be successful. Thanks, Brian. And just to take a quick step back on social equity, it's it's definitely something that we cannabis industry talk about all the time. It's so important. Um, but just out of respect for some of the, the newcomers to the game, just if I can be really brief on what social equity is here in cannabis and Massachusetts specifically, the Cannabis Control Commission has a program that they call the social equity program. And people who meet certain criteria are able to apply and participate in this program. And they get discounted um, uh, they get free education, access to different sources, they get certain fees waivered, they get priority access um, throughout the application process. Um, so when Brian's talking about how they, you know, they're, they're getting helped to be, um, to be at the front of the line um, as soon as they're able to when they have all the, the pieces of the application put together. Um, so partnering with them in of priority and its delivery um, and uh, eventually social consumption. But right now we have um, delivery. In fact, Taylor Weaver over here is with Cush Cart. That's going to be one of the first um, delivery operators. His partner was a social equity program participant, um, and they're developing a f facility out in East Ham. Um, but um, it's just a very important part. So you're going to hear a lot of that. Um, so if you have any questions, Elevate's happy to, happy to help there. But um, and we'll take questions at the end, too. I just wanted to make sure that people were familiar with the, the social equity um, program, at least here in Massachusetts. Um, all right, so moving along, I'm actually going to go right back to you, Brian. So we talked about the challenges of finding a site and, and understanding the regulations. Garden Remedy has been in operation for five plus years. What have been some of the challenges about just expanding and growing and evolving as an existing operator? Yeah, no, uh, uh, I will tell you, so I, my previous, I was in private equity. I was in public accounting. I worked at bioenergy startup, and then I worked in a fintech startup. So like I've worked in some pretty aggressive or some pretty difficult industries. This is by far the most difficult industry I've ever worked in, like bar none. But it's the most, I've enjoyed, it's been the most amazing uh, industry I've been in. I've been here for almost two years. What, what, what this industry goes through is basically getting doors slammed in our face every minute of every day. I can't donate to the Greater Boston Food Bank. My company cannot donate money to the Greater Boston Food Bank. They have to reject, they, their lawyers reject our donations because they're afraid they're gonna lose federal funding by taking money from cannabis. So I can't even donate money. I go to people, we have special permits at most of our facilities and neighbors tell us that they have to shy their clothes, cover their kids' eyes when they walk by our dispensary so the kids don't see the word cannabis and ask them what it means. So there's still a lot of that going on, like all over the place. And, but what's amazing to me and what I love about it is it takes conversations to turn people. Just a conversation, a simple conversation. I said about yesterday, I was at a conference and I actually gave this and I was told I shouldn't, but my mother, my mother has never smoked. Maybe she smoked once in her life with my dad, who whom probably smoked a little bit more than my mom smoked weed growing up. Never touched any of that stuff. Always been like straight and narrow. She has had so many sleeping problems her entire life. Well, always been a terrible sleeper. She's been on Ambien. She's been on all the things that are out there. She now uses a THC CBD tincture that she buys from my company and sleeps like a baby is off all of her prescriptions. It's, it's what's great about cannabis is it can provide fun in a healthier way than something like alcohol, but it also provides potential health benefits. And the more we're going to learn about cannabis, because we're going to be allowed to do more research in the U.S. and all that, we're going to actually have proof as opposed to just my mother or me. I'm a, I'm a migraine. I, I have chronic migraines. I get migraine. I used to get migraines basically every other day. I'm off all my prescriptions. I'm literally, I use a THC CBD tincture at night before I go to bed and I get um, I get Botox injections in my head and neck, which isn't fun every 12 weeks, but it's better than taking opioids every time I got a, I got a migraine and then either having to leave work uh, because I'm on an opioid or power through it, right? So it's those types of things. So, sorry, I went off on a, I digress. <laughs> I love talking to new people about cannabis, so I apologize for that. But, but overall, garden <laughs> remedies, passion in this we've industry. grown really, we've grown really well over the past five years. We've, what we try to do and our goal is, is to 
grow with the industry. Because you'll see, you've heard the names, Mad Men or things like that. People put flags everywhere for cannabis because it is going to be a booming country. It's going to be a booming industry, projecting $80 billion industry in the next seven years. Massachusetts, who's been uh, adult use for three years, we're, this year, we're projected to hit almost 1.4 billion in adult use sales. 1.4 billion, three years ago, zero legal. Obviously, illicit sales were what they were. So this industry is growing. They're talking about New York being oh, over 3 billion. Like the New England area, the Northeast of the United States is going to be the largest cannabis consumption market in the entire world. And so as long as you follow the regs and, and grow with the industry, you're going to be fine. The people that do it wrong get way too big, way too early. Don't follow the regulations. Try to be, do it too fast. You need to be smart, slow. And then the other piece is you need to find the right team because it's hard. You're going to get door slammed in your face and you need to have the team that's willing to smile and knock again. For sure. And there's, of course, some systems that need to be in place. Security is a huge issue for cannabis. It's regulated. There's all sorts of regulations related to security from cameras and doors and access points and all that. So Jason, tell us a little bit about that kind of system, a unified security system, how it can help people stay compliant, you know, why, why that's important. Absolutely. So Brian, to your point, Genotech is, you know, the partner to grow with, right? <laughs> so if, uh, you know, if you guys are expanding, uh, we often find that, you know, we, we find growers that are starting out, you know, they just read the regulation and they want, hey, I just need some cameras. I need some access control into the building. And, you know, they, they, they meet the regulation requirements, right? But as they grow and they expand, uh, they find themselves, you know, it's difficult to manage multiple locations, bringing all of that data, you know, and, and seeing what's happening at all of their different uh, grow facilities or retail, whatever it may be. So in a nutshell, you know, Genetech simplifies that and brings every system within a grow facility or retail or the transport of such product all the way to, you know, through the chain, right? Um, you know, we simplify that and bring that all into a single pane of glass, right? So you're not hunting and pecking and trying to find, all right, what is my CO2 level? What is my temperature level? The luminance, you know, in different rooms, you can literally pull up your phone and then see what that looks like, you know, from wherever you are, 30,000 feet. So we believe that that gives you, um, gives the operators a tremendous edge in, you know, responding, uh, preventing the uh, loss of product, right? And then also when it comes to, you know, you get those regulators come knocking on your door, right? You want to make sure that that video is there. I mean, otherwise you're, you're going to get shut down, you know, and you're not going to be able to keep producing products. So there's a lot of pieces to it. It's all critical. And uh, Genetech certainly, you know, brings all the pieces together. For all the different components from the minute you step on the property, they have cameras that are providing video and break in, or you have a suspicious vehicle coming around the vehicle, you could search all the different, you know, certain colored vehicles, license plates, whatever it may be. And then, you know, providing that, uh, you know, report to regulatory requirements, you know, that's uh, it's really important. So that's really what Genetic does. We do a lot. Thanks, Jason. Uh, I want to go back to uh, Kristen and Raymond and um, talk a little bit about, you know, we understand compliance, we understand the regulations, we're ready to purchase a property or rent, lease a property. Um, so I want to go to um, Raymond. What are the benefits and drawbacks of leasing versus purchasing a location for a cannabis facility? Yes, thank you. Um, so I think the biggest hurdle to purchasing a property, and we've heard um, a little bit um, from our other speakers, is the lack of financing and loans and mortgages for uh, cannabis facilities. And that, um, you know, the initial purchase, the construction of a facility are, are some significant costs that, um, you know, are difficult unless you have a, a strong investor with a lot of cash um, that's willing to dive into an uncertain market. Um, it's very difficult to find institutional funding. Um, I, I will touch on just briefly the uh, SAFE Act, which, um, you know, passed the House for the fifth time, I think. I, I think the consensus is there's no chance it's really going to pass the Senate, uh, Senate's vote. But um, for those of you that don't know, the SAFE Act um, would ultimately allow 
uh, loans and, and banking for uh, cannabis facilities. I think I heard one of my co-speakers mention that the social uh, justice and social impact of it. I think it's crucial for small businesses to be able to get access to those types of funds uh, to be able to purchase a facility and, and construct a facility. Um, so I do, you know, I'm hopeful something like that will come um, hopefully sooner rather than later, but I don't believe that the current um, SAFE Act passage is going to develop into anything uh, significant. And I've also heard from a number of senators that they do want a more comprehensive cannabis bill um, that will include provisions of the SAFE Act that, and will have more of a social justice reach. Uh, something like that, I think, would trigger a bigger, per, you know, um, influx of investment to purchase and construct uh, facilities. But right now, it seems like the lease option is the most favorable. Um, I think uh, we heard that the, um, if there's a landlord that has a mortgage, um, you know, and they're leasing to a cannabis facility, you may run into a situation, you know, even a year or two down the road that could put a wrench in the entire operation. Um, but it does um, seem like a, a longer term lease, you know, a 10 year lease, um, that would allow for the construction and in, in invest, initial investment costs to be recouped um, is probably the safer um, option at this point. Um, a shorter term lease would allow for a landlord who kind of gets negative comments from their uh, lender or, or the public to, that may sort of change their mind um, after maybe one or two years where the investment's not recouped, um, you know, could absolutely be problematic. Um, what I've seen too is there's a, a, a niche of businesses that will ultimately um, purchase the property, construct, and then lease it back to the um, the operator. And you know those those are growing. You know the issue there is they like to have a lot of control and a lot of oversight of the business, which may not uh, necessarily drive with the the operator's um, you know investment goals, but. You know, that's one thing to consider as well is there's a number of companies now that have kind of engaged in that business of, you know, upfronting the cost, purchasing the property, and then ultimately um, leasing it back to the uh, operator. So, you know, in, in some, I think that area is, is um, you know, subject to change in the future as the SAFE Act and, and things of, um, you know, that nature do get passed at the federal level. But right now, the lack of institutional funds, small business loans, I think makes uh, leasing a, a, a more sensible option. Thanks, Raymond. And just moving on to Kristen, uh, whether it's a lease or purchasing, whatever the arrangement is, what are some important deal terms uh, that operators should be negotiating at this point? Yeah, I couldn't agree with Raymond more. Uh, I would suggest that it really depends on the use, the ultimate use of the property. And forgive me, uh, what once was a quiet area is now a little bit noisy. Can you see everyone? Can you hear me okay? Yeah, okay. Sorry about that. Uh, we must have let out. Um, so in terms of uh, leasing versus purchasing, I, I would suggest that it depends on the type of property that you're looking at, depends on the type of use. Uh, certainly you want to have as much capital accessible to you as possible. So owning a property locks in your capital uh, for the long term and doesn't let you access it. So in a lot of scenarios, specifically retail, on-site consumption, uh, those scenarios, it, it, it most likely would make sense for uh, rental of the property. Uh, one thing that I, I would like to impart to the crowd is, is that, uh, you know, when you're securing your license, uh, excuse me, if when you're securing your real estate for a license um, in a competitive environment, one of the key things that you want to do is negotiate as much as possible up front in your LOI. Because as soon as you get your license, you're going to want to go to town and there are going to be so many other considerations that, that are going to pull your attention away from the actual lease. And the lease is so important because that's how you live and breathe within your space and how you interact with your landlord ongoing. So as an example, uh, you know, I had a client who um, uh, was a large uh, multi-state operator. And at the dispensary level, they were dealing directly with the landlord on issues, uh, uh, property uh, management issues. And there was a leaky roof in a dispensary at one point, and the manager, just being a savvy manager, took, the, took control of the situation, called the local handyman, and took care of the leak in a day. Well, the long and the short of that is that there was a warranty on the roof. 
that the landlord had uh, established uh, as a result of a repair uh, from a couple of years prior. And that simple act of repairing that roof leak vitiated that warranty. Uh, and if somebody had simply looked at the lease and seen that it was not the tenant's obligation to make that repair, they would not have been in this issue. So that resulted in a default from the tenant. Uh, just simply by making a repair to the to the roof. So it's really important to understand what those considerations are in the lease and to make sure you have a skilled uh, and savvy broker at the front end because your attorney likely won't get involved until you're going to the lease. And that's the, at the point that you already have secured your license. So, you know, having a savvy broker who not only understands how to negotiate a, a commercial real estate deal, but also understands how you're going to live and breathe within that space. There aren't many of us uh, in this space because it's such a nascent industry, but I, I would implore you to to find somebody who really understands uh, how this all works. Thank you, Kristen. Um, so construction, it's, it continues, not just right from the beginning when you're talking about the whole concept of, of creating a cannabis business, but it continues. Um, I had the, the honor of touring GRI's facility, Garden Remedies facility up in Fitchburg, humongous place. Um, but there was some construction happening. We had to wear hard hats at one point. Um, so Brian, tell us a little bit about, you know, that construction cycle, how it continues through as you develop and what you're focusing on now um, to upgrade facilities as it relates to Absolutely. efficiencies or sustainability, anything like that. Yeah, so we're actually in phase six of our build, um, which literally will maximize our building. So it's so bad that we had to turn break rooms into vaults and we now have two temporary construction trailers in our back because we don't have enough room for offices. And that's, from us, that's a growing pain, and it's because you can only have licensed marijuana products at your location. So we have 85,000 square feet, and we're running out of space. Uh, so we're doing other things. So we're actually expanding into another, we have a, a space and um, another space that we're expanding into um, where we're going to seek a, a license so that we can continue to do it. But that is actually something you have to plan a lot of this stuff up um, pretty pretty substantially. So our build-outs have been phases, and that's what I was saying, like doing it in a, in a smart, in a meaningful manner, in a, a simple way that allows you to, to slowly but surely build your business with the market is important. Because this market is very up and down and volatile, even in a state like Massachusetts that's been around for three years. Um, what we're doing is we're scaling up now our production. So we, like I said, we do all of our cultivation. We also have a lab that processes, takes flour or cannabis to, from an actual like plant that you can smoke or, or something like that to an oil that doesn't smell, doesn't really have a taste, um, but it's just almost straight THC. That's called a distillate, right? That distillate then can be used to put into any range of products. So your tinctures, which are like the little drops you put under your tongue a gummy, a piece of chocolate, a vape pen, so you can, you can vape it, um, or any other thing. So we're producing and scaling up so that we now have a commercial kitchen. So we can make, we make I think by hand, every day our team makes 42,000 gummies, literally pulling by hand. And, and, uh, and we, we've, people see it, it's all the time. Beth was there for it. So you can have well, a we're, Popeye arm. That's right. So <laughs> we're literally going from hand pull to, okay, now we have enough scale, let's put in a gummy line. So that's kind of the way you have to look at it. So like I said, we're in our sixth year, sixth phase of build, um, and that building will be complete. Now we're actually looking to expand a little bit more in mass for, for that purpose, but we're also looking in New York, we're looking in New Jersey, we're looking all around the, the uh, Northeast, and it's for opportunity. So I, I agree with everything that was said um, by, uh, on the legal side and procuring land. The other thing I'll tell you is you better have someone that understands the host community agreement or HCA. So let me give you one example. We were looking at an opportunity with a social equity participant where we were going to potentially invest with them um, in a really nice site in a good locality. That locality had a, has a, another cultivation facility. And near that facility, not close enough that would be a problem, but near it was some residential. And fit cultivation facilities smell. They just smell like weed, especially if the wind blows in a certain way. It just smells. not crazy. It's not like a paper mill that just reeks it's only in the general area but it smells the it smells residents, great it's well <laughs> reach his own right but um so the residents complained and so when this new group came in the town said well that's fine we'll sign an hca but 
you need to um, guarantee that you won't have um, any smell issues, any scent issues. Well, they had no idea what they were doing. So they said, yeah, that's no problem. I'll sign that. How? There's zero way to guarantee that. And so we literally said to them, guys, unless you're going to go back to the town and get that taken out, we can't invest in this because there's no matter how much technology you put into it, it's still potentially going to smell. And all it takes is one person. And then you've breached your post community agreement with your town. So you've got to be super careful because there are people that look just to take you out. There sure are. And I always say, don't be a narc. <laughs> Um, so I what you mentioned New York a little bit. I want to go back to Kristen. Kristen, if you can hear us, okay. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about you know the main differences right now? Obviously, Massachusetts has a more established market but for um, those that are you know trying to open up a cannabis business in New York. What are the big differences as far as um, real estate? Yeah, well, as you can hear in the background, there's a lot of excitement around New York uh, We just heard from Senator Liz Kruger, the sponsor of the MRTA bill. Uh, but this has been a seven-year-long slog for her and, and the rest of us uh, fighting for legalization. Uh, in terms of real estate, I think the thing that is most exciting for us is that we are a state that has New York City, which is an exciting retail environment full of eight and a half million people. But we are also a state that has like 12 million people who live outside of New York State. And that is exciting to me. I hail from the city of Syracuse where 38% of the population live below the poverty line. And for me, this is an opportunity for general generational wealth creation for communities that have been suffering and underserved uh, around the state, not just New York City. Uh, the potential for opportunity is tremendous. I mean, we're seeing um, more and more activity on the cultivation and processing side in uh, Western and Central New York, uh, in, on Long Island. Um, lots of communities that uh, are not typical uh, um, environments for business activity and for, for frankly, for nascent industries. So I'm really excited about that potential. Uh, another difference is that we have on-site consumption, which is very exciting for us. Um, you know, we're, we've yet to see what that will look like in terms of the rules and regs, but I have uh, a lot of excitement and, and a lot of clients who are interested in, for instance, uh, on-site consumption with boutique fitness, uh, on-site consumption with um, uh, spa and, and health and wellness activities. So we're not just talking about uh, um, a bar scenario that serves cannabis. We're talking about all uh, other aspects of hospitality that are gearing up for the on-site consumption systems. Uh, so that's the difference. Uh, we also have, uh, unlike our neighbors in New Jersey, we also have home growth. I was just talking to Senator Kruger about that this morning. I mean, I remember at the very beginning of our legalization efforts, uh, there were many who told us, don't, don't worry about home growth. It's not something that's achievable. Let that go. And I'm here to say that uh, because of our leadership in, in the Start Smart Coalition and our leaders like Sandra Fridley from the Gun Policy Alliance, uh, they asked us to stand firm in our, our understanding of uh, the, the uh, uh, points that we wanted in the bill. Uh, automatic expungement, uh, that is new to New York. Uh, up until re uh, recently, we only had the ability to seal records. Uh, now, because of this bill, we also have the opportunity to expunge records uh, for uh, people who have been caught up in the criminal justice system as a result of cannabis uh, or replacing. And those folks will, as we um, alluded to earlier with, the, with respect to the social justice aspect of the bill, uh, Folks who have been uh, impacted by uh, racially biased enforcement will have priority in uh, obtaining the generational wealth creating licenses. So it's, it's exciting all the way around. And we can't wait uh, to see what the, the um, uh, Office of Cannabis Management rolls out with the regulations. Uh, we are fully staffed now. Our new governor, uh, Kathy Hochul, uh, made her last appointments last week. And uh, we're really excited to see them get to work. Uh, I'm told that there is a, a meeting as early as next week to uh, uh, get the CCB together and to start uh, uh, working on the reg. So it's really exciting. And forgive me for the, the noise. Kristen's been a, a tremendous advocate in the New York area. And in addition to her professional work as an attorney, um, you know, she's such an incredible um, uh, resource to you all. So if you have New York ambitions, I definitely encourage you to get in touch with Kristen. Um, so just moving along, uh, we want to leave some time for questions, but 
obviously I'm sure everybody shares the observation that there's, oh my gosh, there's this, there's that, there's all these different departments and responsibilities that, that think, you know, somebody needs to be uh, watching all this. Um, so Jason, before we go into questions, um, you know, how do data points and devices assist operations at, at, a, at a cultivation facility in particular? Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, as I talked about a little bit earlier, um, you know, getting, getting all the different data points, you know, for uh, the facility, you know, the, the building automation platforms come to um, platform. It's just going to allow people to respond more efficiently knowing what's happening at the facility when, you know, you're having a centralized monitoring location. Uh, there could be, you know, 25 to 100 locations that a company may be monitoring at one single point of time. And we provide a uh, security operations, you know, platform, right? And standardizing, you know, if this is happening or it, it could be an evacuation, it could be a fire system, it could be any type of critical infrastructure, right? And, you um, you know, really gathering all of those data points that happen within a facility and responding efficiently, right? So that you you can inform the first responders what's happening and maybe what chemicals are within certain areas and, you know, life safety measures, right? So, um, you know, we have one client that uh, wants to use our evacuation assistant, right? So they might have uh, 50 people operating within the facility. Something happen happens, uh, they're being proactive to maintain the safety and security of their employees. And they want accountability for anyone that, you know, uh, has evacuated the building so that they can inform first responders that, you know, hey, we have uh, two or three other people that might be been within a critical area that we need to go in and, and uh, respond to. So there's just a lot that goes into it. And as I pointed out, you know, you have uh, the infancy of uh, a growing company you know, they start out, they check the boxes, you know, they say, all right, we just need to do this according to this. But as they grow, you know, they're going to want to be more efficient with managing all these different locations. And that's where Genentech can step in and really, uh, really help organizations grow with, you know, their, their growing business. So um, that's really, you know, that's pretty much it. Thanks, Jason. All right, uh, I'd like to open up for any audience questions. Um, and if Raymond and Kristen are still there, um, we'll, we'll get questions to you too, if you, can, if you can't hear the audience. But any questions um, for our panel? No? Brian, if you're looking for someone to do, uh, send donations to, uh, I'm always open. All right. I'll take that. <laughs> Brian, you had mentioned uh, having issues even donating to a food bank because they were concerned about getting involved with, with this industry, being a federal, uh, receiving federal funds. Have you had issues with any other industries, even just as simple as banking, um, not wanting to get involved with you? You know, you can't just oh, keep yeah. all the money in the walls, I'm sure, but. <laughs> no, no. So listen, banking in mass is a little bit different than other places. So safe banking is something that's going on um, in Congress right now. To be honest, my personal opinion, it's not going to change Massachusetts very much. We have in our state, um, we have uh, credit unions that are chartered by the state that are banking for cannabis. So that's helpful for us. So unlike some other states that have issues, like we have a bank account, we actually at our uh, dispensaries are able to take either cash or debit card. We cannot take credit. So me as a CEO of this company, I can't even have a corporate credit card. So we can't do anything with Visa, MasterCard, Amex, Discover, any of that because it's federally illegal. So the only way, thing we can take are, like I said, debit cards and debit terminals or cash. So we have ATMs in our stores. Uh, that's Banking is one of the hardest parts about it. I can't get a loan. Small, when COVID hit, I was two months into my job. We lost 90% of our revenues because Massachusetts decided that cannabis, adult use of cannabis was not deemed to be um, critical, even though alcohol was. And even though every other state and every Canadian province where cannabis is legal deemed cannabis to be critical, just like alcohol. So we had no ability to go to the Small Business Loan Administration for any of the COVID CARES Act programs or any of that because we're federally illegal. We still can't go to SBA can't go to most banks. Um, we can't use, I've had five different payroll companies kick us off their systems. Um, we rebuilt our entire website on WordPress, which is a, I don't even know what they are, but they're like, they, that's where you publish your website. 
WordPress uses is used by five or six other Massachusetts-based cannabis companies for our websites. So we put our website on there. Two days later, it was taken down, and they deemed us to be breaking their terms of use because we were marketing an illegal product, even though we said, look at all these other guys. It didn't matter. So we spent two more months and literally spent the exact same money that we did and had to build it in a new program. So yes, every aspect of our business is challenged. There's the cannabis tax, they call it. Everything you do is more expensive. It took our company four years to get a 401k plan put in place because no one would allow us to invest. So yeah, it's hard, but it's going to be a, a generational wealth is going to come from cannabis. It's cannabis is essentially post-prohibition alcohol. If you think about it, it's in that gray area of legal because federal's not there. Every state's trying to figure it out, but it's coming. There are, I'll give you guys a quick, one more, more quick stat that I love to share with people. So in Massachusetts, we did a study, 21 plus. So Massachusetts adults, 16% of Massachusetts adults said they do not use cannabis and they have no interest in cannabis whatsoever, 16%. 26% of adults are users. That leaves 58% of the Massachusetts adult use population, which is over 3 million people in that 58%, that they, they don't use or they haven't used, they, we call them lapsed users or no, non-users. People that haven't used in say five, 10 years, 15, 20 years from college days, um, or people that just have never used it, like my mother before, that learn about it, are, are interested in learning more and potentially use it. There are people from that use that, there are elderly people that don't want to get high, but have, suffer from arthritis. Our THC, CBD salve that you put on your, on your arthritic areas doesn't make you high and works a hell of a lot better than almost anything else. The CBD stuff you buy in, from gas stations is crap. It's Don't not do real it. CBD. Don't waste your money. If you're going to really want something like that, go to a true, either a CBD store or go to a, go to a cannabis store and get some of the THC stuff because it's really much better. It really does work. And just, just to go back to the question. So in addition to Elevate, I, I have an LLC. I run a marketing agency. I don't tech, I don't sell cannabis. I don't touch the plan. I don't have a license to operate my business. But like Brian mentioned last year, when all these people were applying for PP, PPP loans, I couldn't get one from the bank that I have longstanding accounts with, a credit union. Multiple banks said no to me um, as a small woman-owned business that had lost a lot of clients because... Marketing is one of those first things that goes during downtimes, right? Um, so even little old marketing me, I couldn't get that. So that's something to think about. Even if you're not touching the plant, there's a lot of risk still getting involved in cannabis. And that's why I encourage people to just, you know, again, know those regulations and understand some of the history too. And I think that why cannabis was ever made illegal. And I think the more empowered you are with information, the more confident you're going to go, you're going to be going into these kind of tumultuous and weird waters. But as you know, Brian said, it's a matter of when, not if, for federal legalization. It's going to happen. And the more that folks like us in this room can be communicative with our local, state, federal leaders, um, the more we can help move that, that along. So I definitely encourage folks to be loud and proud and, uh, of yourself for, for being in the room today and being a part of this industry and taking it you know, outside of your own business doors to try to help advocate where you can um, for all of us. And so the rising tide will lift everybody. Um, so any other questions? Yeah, that being said, don't uh, tell anyone you were here. <laughs> no, <laughs> stop it. <laughs> All right, well, uh, just, well if we could uh, just actually, get... Actually, I have a question oh. for, the, for the people in New York. Uh, so when do they expect to be issuing the first licenses in that um, market? We need regulations first, Rick. <laughs> They're all excited there, I can hear. Yeah. So Rick, I would say, so it sounds like Kristen's timeline, like she said, it sounds about right. They've just done their regulators. So I've been doing a lot of work in New York as well. What we're hearing is they're, they're hoping for applications and all that. Well, they're going to, they're going to write the regs, probably get them out there sometime in Q1 is what they're saying. Me personally, my bet is you're not going to see the first adult use sale in New York until 2023. Now, that being said, there'll be a ton of activity in 2022. So my guess is it's going to be in 2022 where you start to see the applications and stuff like that. But again, you got to look at other states like Massachusetts. It took some time. Jersey's delaying. So we're going to have to be patient. And really, even Jersey has issued their initial regs. 
but they haven't even issued their application, their scoring system and all that. So even though the regs are out, we still don't have all of the information to really know. So it's gonna be a process. I think we also have to take into account that the uh, building materials are much more scarce than they ever were. The Suez Canal really uh, put, a, put a monkey wrench into uh, the construction, construction and building materials accessibility to, uh, uh, to build out the retail and the uh, public and property facilities. So not only are we going to see delays in just rolling out the program, but the actual physical construction is going to take a little bit. And I can imagine that, uh, especially in New York City, the Department of Buildings is going to have a box backlog with Germany. So all of these practical considerations around the actual uh, construction of these facilities, I believe is going to cause additional delays. All right, I was just gonna ask everybody, starting with Raymond, to let us let our audience know how you can be found if they have follow-up questions. Raymond, are you still with us? Yes, um, so I can be reached at um, the uh, Forcelli Deegan Tirana LLP website, and my email is um, rcastronovo, C-A-S-T-R-O-N-O-V-O, -O at forcellilaw.com. And um, we're, we've seen a big influx of um, new cannabis uh, entrepreneurs coming to us to consult on a variety of matters, so we, uh, you know, we look forward to hearing from anybody that has uh, some questions. No doubt. Thank you. Uh, Kristen? No, you've got to run, but how can folks find you if they have questions? Yeah, we just put up our website, so I'm really excited. Take a look. It's parkjordan.com, and you can find me at Kristen, K-R-I-S-T-I-N, period, Jordan, J-O-R-D-A-N, at parkjordan.com. Thank you so much, Beth and Rick. Thanks, Kristen. All right, Brian, how can folks find you? My computer is hard. <laughs> And Jason. Yeah, pretty simple. I have some cards here. And, um, you know, if there's a distribution list, i uh, be happy to send my contact out to uh, everyone, even virtually. All right. Very good. And how do we get a hold of you, Beth? Oh, yeah. ElevateNE.org or BethWaterfall.com. And uh, I'll Elevate, explain a little bit about what the organization. So Elevate 501c3, pre-COVID, we were doing events all the time, uh, networking and educational events, and also going into different community centers and just trying to educate people about some basic cannabis stuff so they were aware of different programs that existed and also to just assuage fears related to cannabis and for these businesses coming into their neighborhoods. Um, we've been virtual the past year, but we're, uh, I'm excited. We're planning an event right now with the town of Watertown. Um, I haven't told you about this yet. Uh, uh, they contacted us to come in and do a presentation at the town library, just some 101 stuff uh, for the community. So we love to do that type of thing. So um, if you're interested in working with Elevate, we'd love your support so that we can do more of that. And if you want to create more interest, uh, I would pump the room with some cannabis. And, and I think they'll, they'll I didn't smell like it when more I came on in. your side at the end of that. Meeting. <laughs> We'd love to. We'd love to. It's just, those regs. Those regs are fishy things. Like we can do billboards. So you probably have seen my Garden Remedies billboard here or there. But like, that's about it. Social is, it's, it's hard. And the Newton shop's not too far. Not far. Up 95, up the bike. <laughs> it's right there. Not far, not far oh, yeah. Depending where you're going. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they'll be great. Nice. All right. Thanks, thank Rick. you, Beth. And thank you to the panel. Thank you, Kristen, Raymond, yeah. Brian, Jason. Yeah. Appreciate it. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Raymond. And thank you, Kristen. Uh, looks like she's having a good time there in New York. <laughs> she's a rainbow room. Uh, and we're <laughs> going to move on to our next panel. I want to thank our sponsors before we go to the next panel. I want to thank U.S. Pavement Services. I want to thank Sano Rubin. Construction Services, who uh, they will be speaking on the next panel, uh, MC Andrews, which you can find right over here on the left, uh, Forcelli, Deegan, and Tirana, and uh, Raymond, who was just speaking, is with that firm, Northmark, Genetech, who Jason was just speaking right there, uh, Bonds Building and Management Group, and Marty Bonds is right there. Vantage Builders, Inc. You can find uh, the Vantage Group right over there. Uh, Garden Red Remedies Cannabis, which is Brian, who just spoke. And I want to, if anyone's interested in purchasing a cannabis, of a future cannabis site, you can see Kristen Foodie right over there. 
and she has a beautiful property that is for sale that is ready for cannabis. And I am going to be the moderator for the next panel. So God help us. I, I think we have Okay. All right, I want to introduce our next panel. We have uh, two speakers and we have uh, Peter Regan from Vantage Builders. He is sitting to my right here. And I think we have, uh, we have Dave Hollander of Sino Rubin Construction Services. I think he is on. I, th I, think I am on. on. Oh, there you go. Can you hear me? I'm on. Good yeah, morning. We can we can hear you and see you. Good morning, Rick. Good, Good morning. morning. I appreciate you coming on. It's uh, and Dave is in New York as well. So before, well, let's we'll just start off the the questions right now. Uh, and the first questions are going to be to Dave. And, and let's talk about a couple of projects and and where have you built. Uh, some of these projects, these cannabis facilities? So we just recently completed uh, a 60,000 square foot facility outside, um, I guess that's uh, Eastern Pennsylvania, outside of Scranton. Um, 30,000 square feet of greenhouse and 30,000 square feet of uh, head house uh, processing and, and laboratories and manufacturing. So that was a very successful project. Uh, did that through COVID, extremely difficult, tight site, tight schedule, um, but very successful. Great. Uh, so, so what would you say a, a cannabis operator who is looking for land to build a growth facility, what should they be looking for? Well, uh, we've been involved in several of these now, and um, each time it's different. But uh, whether it's uh, land, raw land or um, you know, an old warehouse that can be retrofitted, you really need to understand what one, the municipality will allow. Is there enough power to the building? Uh, what are the environmental requirements? Is the storm sewer sufficient? Is you have to hold it on site? Can you discharge it to the city system? Uh, what's the quality of the land? We've been on some sites that the owner was actually shocked at the site development costs exclusive of the building uh, because there was a lot of rock or the soil conditions were very poor. You really need to investigate those things and do due diligence beforehand. Not all land is equal and it could severely impact the development budget on, on the cannabis grower. Great, thank you, Dave. Uh, now we're gonna go to Peter. Uh, if I could just have everyone uh, Take a seat for a minute or two uh, so we can get the questions out to the panel because the conversations in the room are interfering with the call. So, um, Peter, is, is there a common design for building out a facility or is each one customized build? Thanks, Rick. It's not like you're doing a Verizon commercial. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yeah, mo most of these are unique uh, designs that are relative to building construction and the site selection. Um, the things they do have in common is really the, the flow of how their uh, the product is made and grown. They all have the same type of room that, from the clone, mother veg to flower. Um, once you get into harvest and dry, 
Um, and then in the manufacturing, I think uh, they all have that same kind of flow of how the buildings are laid out, but the design of them are all individual depending on the, the AE team. Uh, you can get into different HVAC systems, the way they're looked at, uh, whether first cost is a consideration or the uh, operating cost too. And a lot of these things come into play on in how that budget is developed. So, you know, uh, we, we were talking in the last panel with Gen Genetech, who they are a security type. So when you're building out, is that a concern on the structure? Uh, because I'm sure there's, you don't want any kind of uh, extra entry points or, uh, you know, corners that are non-visible, you know, where someone could break in. Yeah, well, part of the, the CCC regulation is that every square inch of the plant has to be visible. So every inch of that is on video and has to be seen. That's the, one of the things that they check when they do their um, inspections that before they give you your sign off of your license. So that's uh, something that a lot of times the owner is hiring the security companies also and we're coordinating those, but uh, not necessarily hiring those companies. But yeah, that's definitely the one number one thing the CCC looks into is security. Uh, right now with construction, uh, there's, uh, well, I, I shouldn't say right now because it's always been an issue. Uh, are, are the common issues specific to cannabis facilities that you have when you're building out a project? Well, a lot of the uh, the challenges with these, uh, like any project right now, that, you know, the supply chain that's impacting every project out there, uh, even more so for some of these grow facilities we're doing because of the specialty equipment. Um, you know, things that uh, power requirements and gear that's being used and equipment that's being used is just uh, even further out than normal equipment that you use on a build out. So th those are some of the things we're seeing, um, you know, things that challenge, like has been mentioned about power requirements, these grow facilities, you know, not so much the retail, but the grow side are, are huge power consumers that a lot of times the utility doesn't have enough power and options have to be looked at with on-site production of power, water, cooling, all that with their own plant. Um, if the grid doesn't have enough power on that, because some of the times we're looking at two and three years out for the uh, utility to bring in power and that just you know squashes the deal. Great, thank you, Peter. Uh, Dave, uh, since utilities are a major factor in a facility, what are some things you can use that can make operations uh, be more efficient to operate as far as energy. Well, Peter touched on it. Um, we are not involved in this project, but it's a project in the Albany region, the greater Albany region, upwards of a 200,000 square foot facility. They don't have enough power in the industrial part that they're in. So it goes back to my, your first question to me, Rick. Um, you know, you, you have to do your due diligence and find out if, you know, you have to do a back of the napkin calculation to see what the rough order of magnitude of your power and utility needs are. And then if you're short, you know, there's cogeneration on site. Some facilities are doing that. You could do solar, right? You could look at um, the systems within the building. They are an incredible power user, but we've been involved in some where they weren't using LED lights. So obviously you can use LED lights and bring down your power requirements somewhat. So there are things you can do to primarily supplement what the building's going to need, which would be cogeneration in some form, either either a gas um, generator or or solar or two. So and there might be other incentives through this through the different states or utility programs where you if you do do some green energy, you you might offset some of the cost of operations. But what I know with solar. Uh, that's specific to uh, direction because you want to be able to create the most energy from the sun. Uh, is that part of uh, when you are going solar do you, and you're building a new structure, would you have to situate that property so you could get that the most out of the solar? Uh, it is a consideration, but remember, you're likely to have... Uh, roof tens of thousands of square feet big 
right? So there's a large roof that you can sit on. You can have a large parking lot for the facility. So you could do parking structures with solar arrays on the top and park underneath. You know, you could figure all that out to, to get the best efficiency for the development. Did you have something to add to that, Peter? In the Northeast, I think we're seeing, or at least in Massachusetts, that most of the um, tendencies are to do indoor grow. Some other regions are looking at, uh, you know, uh, greenhouse grow, but uh, the challenge here in the Northeast that is with, you know, the solar in, uh, impact, most people think that that's a tougher, tougher grow to do, but there are some successful ones being done right now, but they're in the minority. Would that be possible to do an, in, an outdoor grow in the Northeast? Because I'm, I'm kind of, uh, the weather changing yeah. so frequently. Other than your backyard, you probably don't want to do that with the liability of it, but. Well, I'm sure they're already <laughs> doing it in the backyards. Yeah. <laughs> the, uh, but greenhouse is the other option where, you know, you're still needing that solar gain to, to get your, your light rather than artificial light. So that is the other option that's being done too. Rick, I would add to that that uh, I agree with Peter. Um, a lot of the projects are now going to completely indoor grow and bypassing the greenhouse because in the Northeast, unlike say Arizona or Nevada, California, New Mexico, you have to outfit these greenhouses to such an extent that you lose on a first cost basis, you lose any efficiencies. So you can get everything you need in a multi-tier facility in an indoor grow and, and, and uh, be very successful that way. And relative to a comment that was made in the, the panel before us, and Peter mentioned it, there's real supply chain issues and often the greenhouses are coming from abroad. So getting them here is a real wild card and at, really out of the builder's control for our American products, but even so there's, it, it's a supply chain issue. Now, oh, did you have something to add to that? You know, I no. think that's just the number one thing we're dealing with now is the supply chain. And it's, you know, clients don't want to hear, I don't know. They never want to hear that as an option. So, you know, that you're tasked with finding options and solutions all, all the time. But they do like to say, uh, well, I can pay you later. But, <laughs> I don't know, but I'll pay you later. Um, Dave, we talked about this when, when we had a phone call. Uh, when you're building out an indoor facility, it's very important the insulation and the type of wall uh, materials you're using uh, because of the temperatures you need to maintain and the airflow. Yes, so there's, there's strict environmental controls, right? The science of how to grow this plant is still evolving. So it's the, the, the amount of daylight during the plant's life growth cycle before harvest, the type of light that you're giving it, the type of air exchange, how many times does air flow over the plant um, in a given period of time, the humidity control, all of that is critical. And that really can drive up your HVAC cost. Um, so you have to really consider what the end goal is and how much money you wanna spend on a first cost basis versus an operational basis versus what is the benefit of how much more yield do you get or how much higher quality flour is produced. It, and it's still evolving. Every grower we've dealt with has a different idea on how this goes. Now, and this is for both of you, as far as uh, a grow facility, uh, have you been seeing a lot of grow facilities that have dispensaries attached to them or is the dispensary always separated from the grow facility? I'll go, we have not. Um, in New York State, they're separate, but I do know an architect we work with, Vision Architects, they did, they did a facility in Virginia, I believe, and the grow facility has to be, or the, the, uh, the dispensary has to be attached to the grow facility. So I think in Massachusetts, you see because of the regulations and it was touched on earlier, the one, one license for the grow versus three for the retail. And a lot of times with real estate and just functionality of the product and the, uh, the company, they wanna have their flagship 
store next to the, the grow facility. Mm -hmm. you, know, you talk about that smell and that odor that's uh, at these places. That's kind of a, an easy marketing tool too, even though that <laughs> odor mitigation is one thing that has to be controlled by regulation. It's still something that draws people in. Yeah, I, I mean, I would think in this day and age, we would have some kind of a product out there or a way to construct uh, the facility so the odor doesn't escape. There is, but the uh, cost is the, th is, the, is the challenge with that for sure. You know, carbon filtration, um, some other means and methods of doing it. Um, but the, uh, you know, the amount of air exchanges, most of these places are closed loop type of a system in the interior with uh, minimal fresh air brought in from outside, but the, uh, you know, exhausting and all that, and just normal um, containment of a building of the, these sizes of these grow facilities and the canopy that's involved is a challenge. You, well, you, you, I don't think, uh, both of you really don't work on too many dispensaries, mostly grow facilities, right? Uh, we do a number of dispensaries also, yeah. Oh, and, you and those, you know, those retail sites are some, some companies are vertically integrated that garden remedies was talking about where they do grow manufacturing and retail. Others are right now uh, getting into the, uh, cause the, the first cost that you talk about with the retail side is a lot less than having a fully integrated company. They can buy on the wholesale market, get into it. And then later on, you know, it, do that, uh, big financial input with the grow side later on. Yeah, and I was talking to Dave about the dispensaries uh, when we were on a call and he was talking about how that, uh, you know, the, the, the security, uh, like you have to have a vault in there. And, uh, and I think Brian was mentioning a vault as well. Uh, so when you're building out a, a dispensary, it's not like building out a regular retail store. You know, Dave oh, wants the input, but I, on on yeah on the retail, the, some of the specialty items, uh, the security is a is a big cost for all these retail operations. Again, every square inch has to be monitored, and what I think the regulations tell you, you have to have ninety days of backup on a on a DVR someplace. So if if a regulator comes in and says what happened three months ago, you have to show them on tape what happened, and have to document that. So, um, yeah, the vaults construction, um, there's different ways to do that, but yeah, every retail has to have a vault to store product and hundred percent security. You can't look into the facilities from the outsides. You have to have some kind of, uh, opaque glass or no glass or whatever it might be. So there's lots of regulations that go into, into play in those that have to be followed. Well, that brings up a good point. The regulations that are put in place from all these states that have legalized cannabis, do they have a, uh, is, does that make it challenging when you're building out a, a grow facility or a dispensary? Okay, I don't know. Uh, we didn't, you know, to us, it was similar to doing healthcare product, product, uh, projects, right? There's a state component for inspection. Right, but as long as we're doing the build, we're not doing the operation. So once once the you know gear up for the inspection, we didn't really find it too bad at all. And this was in Pennsylvania where we never worked before. So yeah. well, before before we move on, I just want to is there a a land requirement as far as you can build uh, a, a structure here, but you need to have so much land. Uh, open be, to reach your abutters, you know, uh, or if your building has to be so far away from your abutters. I don't think there's anything different in the in the cannabis um, regulations than any other normal one for setbacks, and uh, you know that gets into the what was talked about earlier, the host community agreement, some of those things that specialty right. to certain towns and cities that they might force you into but um other than that it's typical regulation Dave? i would agree with just what peter said it's really a local issue um you know in new york state here you know towns are now passing ordinances even you know will they allow for example retail stores 
or will they allow consumption at a retail store? And they don't even know the rules yet, but they're trying to get out ahead. So in terms of sighting and, and setbacks and distances from your neighbor, it's really a local issue. Um, and some of these facilities are going into industrial uh, uh, parks, if you will. So that's not really an issue once you're inside the industrial park. Are you done? Well, yeah, so as far as it, uh, you have to be so far away from a school or 500 feet, that's it? Yeah. But, but they're, they're the main customers. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so let's... Uh, Let's go to um, talk about the materials that you're going to have to use to build one of these. Is it uh, when you're building a structure, are you, are you able to use like wo a wood structure or does it have to be a cement or an iron structure? What's, what does it usually call for? In Massachusetts, I think, and in, in throughout what we see, because we've talked to uh, clients that do work in other states. The uh, best practice is, is, is to avoid the M word and no one wants to, to hear that word, I guess, you know, mold. That's the detriment to the crop, detriment to, you know, losing money if you have to throw out a room of entire facility, that's huge, huge issue. So anything that can foster that is, is not used. Wood, anything with paper product, any of those things. So everything has got to be washable cleanable and all that anything that is in where the plant is going to be touched live grow nothing that can be fostering mold uh, dave you have anything to add to that no i was just uh, peter pretty much said what i was going to say that you know the rooms have to be scrubbable right so you're not going to introduce uh, materials like wood in there they're it can be insulated panels, which you referenced earlier, or or other scrubbable services applied to a normal wall section um, and the floor. You know, the, the again, it's evolving. We've been in facilities where they have a stone floor, right, and, and rudimentary tables. And as they harvest that plant, they have to then clean the whole floor and wash down the stone and then vacuum it or vacuum it and then wash it. Now they're not doing that anymore, right? They're going to sealed concrete. Or some or epoxy floors where they can, where they can really scrub it and clean it because you have to get rid of the pathogens as well. It's not just about mold. There's other things that they fight against to have the best product uh, crop and best product. So, so we'll go back to what we I think Dave brought up at the beginning is the due diligence that you're when you're looking at a site uh, environmentally, what you need to look for, and what are the th certain the things that you would recommend to someone that's looking to build yeah besides the things that we kind of touched on with power and water and and those things that are um first looks things like uh condition of floor building envelope uh same as some you know normal due diligence but um with epoxy flooring you know doing uh moisture testing or you know existing conditions to testing is the big thing that we do uh, to make sure the right products are selected also. Dave, do you have anything that you would suggest? No, I would just, um, I think Peter covered that. No, I'm sorry. What was that? Yeah, it, we're, and we're gonna take them in a, two minutes, okay? Uh, I see now you made me lose my train of thought and that doesn't take much. <laughs> uh, the effects of cannabis, the, uh, <laughs> it, it took a little bit of time before anyone got that. But <laughs> um, so 
when you uh, well, we were just talking about the due diligence and the uh, and the land, you know, w w and you mentioned the mildew and the moistures. Uh, when you in each different areas of the country, we have all these different issues with weather. Uh, so I would assume that would be something that has to be taken into consideration when you're planning a build on the kind of weather conditions we have here, especially because these plants are so temperamental. Well, most of the time, you know, other than the construction side, the, the weather sh with all indoor grow facilities is in a time to play. Um, and, you know, depending on what systems are used with HVAC, most of these are um, sitting contained, the critical portions. There might be cooling towers and chillers outside or a generator outside, but everything else is inside and in, in a closed loop system. So minimal fresh air brought into spaces. You know, the, the, the areas that are office space or retail are, are a little different, but the grow side is basically acting as a closed system. You know, Rick talk, uh, talked about uh, insulated metal panels and, and all that that can be washable. So once the, the harvest is done, come in with whatever uh, cleaning operations is, is used, chemicals or uh, you know whatever they decide to use a foaming agent and scrub these places down for any pathogens that we're talking about or microbes or uh, little insects that, you know, almost some of these can't be seen to the eye, but they're there and uh, they have to be controlled. Yeah, well, when I, was, when I asked that question, is because the, you know, I, I know how temperamental this is and I know that you have to, you, you must have to use certain materials on the build. In, in different areas because of that. And uh, Dave, uh, and I, I think we mentioned, I think you mentioned something like that when we had a phone conversation. Well, I mean, depending on where you are in the country, what region of the country you're in, right? That's gonna sort of be your baseline building design. So the architect and engineers will take into account local conditions, local weather conditions, local building conditions to build the box. And then as Peter said, What's going on inside the, the, the grow rooms is a controlled environment and in the labs as well. So you're gonna, you know, it's really a two-step process or multi-step process. And then if you, where you really get a lot of variability though, is if the grower says, well, we're gonna use, say you're in Arizona, we're gonna use a greenhouse. And a greenhouse design in Arizona is gonna be very different than one in Colorado and how you, how you um, shade and, and let's say harvest the natural sunlight because there are growers um, that still want to grow with natural sunlight. So what you do in Colorado is very different than Arizona. And that could be a big, di a big difference. You could, have, you could have shading, you could have additional ventilation. There's all kinds of things that you have to do to the greenhouse, depending on where you are. Uh, now with the materials and staffing and all the issues that con this construction industry, as well as a lot of other industries are going through right now, uh, what are you telling your clients uh, on the kind of delay they might have to expect in a build right now? So um, we were just advising on one project and we decided, you know, one project we had finished was a pre engineered metal building for the head house. And um, they were considering it for a grow house, right? That's like a, they call a, like a butler building. The material uh, lead times on metal buildings can now extend to a year. I was just talking to a, a supplier of those buildings yesterday. And the pricing has gone um, significantly higher. Steel is significantly higher, but you still need to build it. So you can consider Traditional structural steel, you might consider a tilt-up uh, warehouse sort of structure. You have to kind of um, do your homework to figure out what the lead times are and the cost-benefit analysis of what a different structural system is. And it changes with, with this supply chain and inflation issue that's out there right now. You know, what, what worked last month may not work this month. It's a, it's a new adventure every day. I don't think any of us have seen this before in the construction industry. Lead time has always been a, a thing that you track, but to not be able to give a definite answer is something that we're not used to. So that's, uh, and to tell clients that this is, like you said, today's 
uh, viewpoint. Tomorrow might be totally different where uh, an order might be delayed. Um, we've seen, we've been told things have been shipping uh, in a week and we've then seen the next week told them they've been delayed three months. So you don't know what's gonna happen in this industry right now and in this economy. What about estimates uh, as far as cost of uh, goods? Because we, we also know that's fluctuating as well. So you can't quote someone a, a price today and it still stands six months from now. Yeah, a lot of the, uh, the proposals going out now are, are giving time limitations on contracts being signed. Um, uh, but in the same realm that to avoid some of these things, we're advising on pre-purchasing large items and, and, and getting those in the queue early on. Um, some things uh, to you know, get the design done early on key items so that can, materials can be released and certain ones that don't matter as much you know, can be, be developed later, but in the design process and the design development or early release pre-purchase items, all that is being considered on each of these large projects. I agree, Rick. Um, I agree with Peter. I would also say that owners need to maybe change their approach and um, instead of a fixed price on the building, consider a construction management agreement where the construction manager is carrying contingencies or allowances for certain items such that you know, we could do just what Peter said and, and deal with the variability of lead times and pricing on materials that's really outside of our control. And maybe it's maybe the speed to market and the, the assurance of getting the building done so you can go to market saving a few thousand dollars uh, in the project because the end, the business, the business result is going to be much, much greater than that. We're going to go to questions. Uh, I know this gentleman over here has a question. Actually, let, let's get you a mic so uh, uh, Dave can hear you and, and I can hear. Well, I'm pretty deaf, so <laughs> I think I got your beat. <laughs> I also have uh, four from the Zoom. Rick. Okay. I know there's been a lot of talk of environmentals, you know, in, in, in rooms and sensitivities. Uh, just in talking to people in this industry, um, obviously one of the key, key components to managing environmentals would be sizes of a room, I would expect, right? Football size field room versus smaller rooms. I'm just curious in, in uh, Dave and Peter's experience, what they're seeing in terms of, I'm talking about flower rooms, you know, is there a quote unquote optimal room size, you know, out there? Cause it seems like there are many, 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 many different opinions. And I'm also curious uh, on the build side, what key materials in the general build are you seeing the longest lead times uh, on? So those, those are really my two questions. Well, let's see, Dave, did you hear that question? I didn't hear the second question uh, in the building side. What was that question? I was just had a, a curiosity. I know you talked about lead times on many of the different general build items. Uh, I was just curious, what were the important materials of the general build have you been finding the longest lead times on? The first question I think you heard in terms of, uh, you know, obviously a key component of controlling environmentals would be the size of the room. I'm, uh, there's a lot, there are many different opinions. I'm just so curious in both from of your my experience. experience. That's really an operational question, the size of the room. Um, are they doing a single tier grow? Are they doing a multi tier grow, two, three grow uh, trays high? Um, and then what's the staffing? So, and how long, you know, they're going to turn that room what, every 12 weeks or something. So, what's it, what are they going to need to do that as the flower grows and then uh, trim it? Um, most, you know, they're really broken down into uh, smaller rooms so that they, you know, whatever yield that they want that facility to have, they know they have a consistent turn of the room. In terms of um, construction material, really, you know, we need to start with the systems and get that as Peter initiated or, or, or yeah, talks just, about. Excuse me, just with mechanical I, I electrical just, systems, I, we need to get that designed early and get it ordered because they have long lead times and they should come in. If you do it correctly, they should come in as the building is 
you know, being enclosed and, and, and being fitted out. Structural steel, if you do a structural steel building, your structure is, uh, whether it's structural steel or not, your structure is key. What, how long is it going to take to get that? Because steel is heavily inflated right now. Prices are elevated and they take a very long time. You might have to switch out joists and go with I-beams because joists are uh, like a year out. So, but again, you have to constantly check. I think we see, uh, we've seen everything on the, on the grow side on, on size of rooms from um, pods. Uh, some of these um, growers have, done, have looked at that and there's some companies out there that are doing almost uh, you know, individual case type grow where they come in and you just supply them power and water and uh, that case is already set up and you just have to plug it into your building um, up to football size fields grow room. So it depends on the grow grower, what their style is, what their, you know, what their thoughts are. Um, I think probably the, the most common one you see is the, the 2,000, 1,500, 2,000, 2,500 square foot grow room, which seems to be the most widely used, you know, size, but everything in between from, like I said, a pod, a, a case to a football field. Um, and most, yeah, the lead time items that, that what, what uh, Dave mentioned is pretty much what we're seeing too, um, depending on the, the, the project and the size of it, it kind of dictates um, how successful that supply chain is right now. Um, some of these larger projects that are 40, 50, up to 100 more thousand square feet, uh, you can accommodate those lead times because the overall project length is a year or more. Um, the smaller ones are more of a challenge. So different things have to be looked at to make those successful. Okay. Uh, Dylan, you had uh, someone? Yeah, so oh, the... Uh, we, yeah, let uh, Brian answer. Um, I think a lot of it uh, depends on if it's an existing facility, right? Because that's going to dictate and determine the overall layout, how much room and space you've got to work with. And within an existing facility, although uh, it can't always be accomplished, but um, I think that most clients wanna see, uh, you know, a similar size within the flower rooms, right? So that they can create consistency within the MEP design, et cetera, going, be going beyond that. So, you know, if you're doing a new build, um, you know, you've got a lot more flexibility. If you're going into an existing facility, that may dictate and determine, you know, more often than not, the, the, how much space you've got to work with. I think, uh, I think some growers are certainly have a, a you know, a, a preference as far as what they're comfortable with. And, and again, people mention whether they're growing in a single level or multi-tier or anything like that, but yeah. It's, you know, I, I was even going to comment on this earlier, but, you know, I think a lot of this also is getting back to what's being done. And because we're in a real estate function right now, I think a lot of this goes back and, and needs to be coordinated and worked out a little bit more up front. I, I understand that there's only so many licenses and areas and, and, and towns willing to accept uh, these types of businesses. But, um, you know, oftentimes, and they've said it before, in order to apply for your HCA, you need to have a lease agreement or purchase and sale or something like that. And, um, you know, I, I think some due diligence needs to be done up front about the existing facility to make sure that it's adequate enough. Never mind just power and water, et cetera, but that, well, is the ceiling height going to be um, adequate enough to support the type of grow you're doing, et cetera. So, um, you know, I don't know where that rubber sort of meets the road, but um, uh, oftentimes we're trying to design within the parameters of the existing facility, right? Uh, and, and, you know, that's a challenge. All right, the Abby Shaw asks, is there a general rule of thumb with uh, square footage when it comes to power and cooling? In, in Massachusetts, CCC regulations uh, limit 
the, the power consumption on some of the, the lighting. Um, and that's one of the first things that's looked at. You know, rule of thumb, you talk about watts per square foot allowed if you're getting your power off the grid. And then there's other things that come into effect with a lot. Uh, there's a list of lighting that's approved by the CCC that um, gives some exemptions to that that are already approved that don't have to go through any other process. There's then there's if you're producing your own power, we can get into different parameters on that. So if you're cogeneration on site where you're producing your own power, then you don't have to always follow by all the rules that are in place. So there's rules, there are general rules of thumb on that consumption, but um, there's lots of ways to do different things that are available out there. And a lot of those are uh, very much um, looked at on the larger places. When you have 100,000 square foot of canopy, your uh, model is a lot different than if you're doing 10,000 square feet of canopy. Dave, did you hear that question? Yeah, I don't have, I don't really have anything to add to what Peter said. Okay. All right, all right. I got another from uh, M. Rodriguez of Forsetti Protection. Um, what do you both recommend for man trap slash front door entry glass protection, window film, ballistic glass? What, what, what we're seeing, I'll jump in, Dave, and you can follow if you want. Um, for intrusion, it's all uh, video, and um, and that is the main deterrent, I would say. We are not seeing much in the way of anything with bulletproof glass just because of the cost of it and uh, not the need for it from most clients' viewpoint. Um, man trap, um, every facility is set up such by regulation that you have to be let in, um, show identification, to get into a retail establishment um, and then one entrance in, one entrance out. So it's all um, monitored by personnel and video. Even the, the grow facilities, they're come completely locked down. You have to be let in and even internal, once you get through the, say the vestibule side, if every all those rooms are, are access controlled as well. So there's a, a very high degree of security just to walk around these buildings. All right. Yeah, we have... Uh, are you ready for more? Yeah, sure. All right. Yeah, so the Abby Shah asks, in terms of lighting, is there a consensus on LEDs versus HPS lighting? Dave, do you want to go first? <laughs> That's, That's a, tough a little one. technical for me, to be honest. We were seeing LED lighting. I think that's a you know, grower preference. Um, we're seeing more and more LED because the technology and the availability of it is getting better and better. Um, and HPS the cost is coming one. down. Yeah, that too. Um, and there's a lot of more companies in, in the play now that, um, that are give the yield and all that that is coming out of the LEDs is getting better all the time. I have two more. If We'll take some audience ones. Thanks, everyone. Um, I'm Taylor Weaver. Beth introduced me earlier. We're going to be one of the first uh, wholesale operators in Massachusetts, uh, which is basically retail on wheels with restrictions. Um, I've got a question. So on our end, well, clearly I have a question because I raised my hand. Uh, but on our end, getting the HCA was one of the hardest things. And for people who can't just throw money, you know, $25,000, here's a fire truck. We typically go in and say, you know, we're going to use resources from the area that we're located in. So for you, both of you, I mean, is it, has there been, you know, a bit of a business development strain and that are you able to only do deals within your locale, or are you able to go find touch points in different communities so that way you can be welcomed in? Yes, you know, our, our spread is right now throughout Massachusetts. We've done work in New Hampshire, um, and we're, we're looking at other opportunities. We're in Florida also, because that market is emerging. Um, you know, the, the talk about earlier about the big question is when will this become federally legal? It's going to is it going to be next year? No, probably not. Is it going to be in our lifetime? I would say absolutely, right? 
because the biggest thing probably driving this industry is money besides, you know, whatever the potential for, you know, health benefits, if you want, you know, the research that's hopefully going to be done and all of that. Cause I mean, my personal viewpoint is it's a plant. What is, what is wrong with a plant, right? Other than, you know, you do some chemical extraction, other things that you go, you're using, but um, how is this different than big farm, right? So, you know, we, we spread out, we see that um, really it's, you know, a lot of times we're following clients to where they're going. Um, and you see, because of the cost of the investment here, um, the touch points really on the grow side are going to more affordable locations where real estate is the lower cost, but, you know, they also want on the retail side that high traffic so that they can sell their product. And, you know, this whole new thing that you're involved with, with being able to deliver and not have a, a, a stagnant, you know, stationary location is, you know, kind of exciting to see how that will play out. So I, I'm looking forward to that. I would agree with Peter. We, we follow the client and the clients are locating in New York state. Um, there are, there are many upstate, but several are in the Hudson Valley now because it's closer to New York city, which is going to be the most massive market probably in the country. Right. So they're going to industrial parks, um, where they, where they have a lot of land, where they have, where the utilities are reportedly there and that they can, you know, um, get in the ground right away, speed to market. You said you a mobile delivery um and oh. so we have to have one warehouse and that's kind of where we got our hca right now we're in cape cod but what we can do is we can put traffic and you know based on our guys do a model but based on the foot traffic in certain townships we'll do you know kind of an amazon delivery style but even to get that first hca it was difficult with cape cod and east Ham, we're saying hey look we'll use you know builders from cape cod but of course that limits who we can work with and so I was wondering if you, you know, had some experience, but you did give me good answers. Uh, we'll try to understand and appreciate that, that uh, these are local communities that are, there's a, there's a vested interest in growing jobs there and, um, and doing work there as well. Um, so we're, pretty open about um, as long as they're qualified and meet certain uh, requirements that we have as a company, uh, working with local subcontractors and, and folks to help support the local communities, right? Um, and, uh, um, you know, I, I think along the same lines too, I know greenhouse has been brought up a number of times tonight, et cetera. And, you know, just aside from the environmental piece, right? Um, you know, there's a push to repurpose a lot of existing infrastructure up here, whether it be manufacturing facilities, mill buildings, or otherwise. And so there's a reason why we're seeing a lot of development and growth in indoor grow. I mean, it's, you know, one is, is helping another in this whole, in this whole effort. So. Very interesting. I'd like to find out more about your business. Uh, I, what was that? I said he won't deliver you, Dylan. <laughs> <laughs> well, see, he doesn't refuse anyone. <laughs> uh, Dylan, any other? Yeah, we have a few more from the Abby Shaw. For a new building. Well, we're going to take one more. We're okay. running out of time. One more. Um, you choose uh, 4,000 square feet. What size of electrical service would be required? Or um, is there an optimal ceiling height for grow rooms? Should you rack or do multi grow levels? I'll skip the uh, electric one Me and too. go to the, the ceiling height. You know, mo most of the, the stuff that we're seeing is, is single tier um, because the, the things that come into play are labor and, and what it costs to maintain multi-level grow also. Um, ceiling height with, multi with single grow is a lot easier to understand. Uh, you see that with the optimal height for a light above a plant and the maturity plant is kind of factored off a table and there's an easy calculation that comes into play with that. And also um, just the maintenance and the handling of the stuff is a lot easier. When you get into multi-tier, 
you know, you're dealing off a, some kind of a structure, ladders, or whatever it is to handle the plants, to, to tend to them all the time, it's a lot more labor intensive. So most of the models we see are single tier grow that we're dealing with. I would agree with that. Um, if you're real estate constrained, then you might, con you know, and you want to get a certain yield, then you're going to explore a multi-level grow operation. And with that comes increased cost because the ventilation requirements are going to go up, lighting requirements are going to go up, irrigation are going to go up. You might have fire protection depending on your municipality and what they determine on how to cover that area. So the costs go up um, maybe even more than proportionately um, when you go to a multi-level grow. That's interesting. I, I would think that would be uh, less expensive than the cost of uh, the, the property. Well, if you think about it, uh, uh, a room full of plants produces a certain load, environmental load, just to keep it basic. Now I've increased the number of plants in the same size room. So I have to provide I still have to meet the environment conditions necessary to grow the plant. So I have further exhaust, I have more air exchanges, more water, more lighting. So. Okay. You know better than me. <laughs> <laughs> Most people do. Well, I want to thank, we're coming to a close. It's been uh, a lot of information today. I want to thank, uh, Dave Hollander of Sano Rubin Construction Services. Thank you, Dave. And Thank you. Peter Regan of Vantage Builders for being with us this morning. I want to thank everyone for coming out. I also want to thank all of our sponsors for today. U.S. Pavement, Sano Rubin Construction Services, MCA, or MC Andrews, Pacelli Deegan Tirana, Northmark, Genetech, Bonds Building and Management Group, Vantage Builders, Garden Remedies, and Kristen Foodie, uh, who has a property that is for sale for <laughs> a cannabis facility. So anyone that is interested in finding out more of the information or has anyone that might be interested in a cannabis facility, uh, Kristen has one. And you can get in touch with Kristen or you can contact me and I will connect you with Kristen. I want to thank everyone again for coming out today. Uh, I know things have been a little difficult out there, you know, with this uh, virus, but the cannabis will solve everything. <laughs> so, oh, uh, who do you want a Dave's email? Dave? Sure. It's uh, D Hollander. D H O L L A N D E R at Sano, S A N O. Rubin, R U B I N dot com, no hyphen as shown in my background. Or you can just go to our website and uh, go through contacts. Okay, and, and Dave is mentioned, uh, mentioned, Dave is located in New York, and I'm sure there'll be a lot of people uh, interested in working on getting properties and licenses in that state because it's the legalization has just been approved this year, and the uh, cannabis committee has been also selected. So licensing should be starting out in uh, another year. Again, Great. thank you all. Thank you all for speaking today. Thank you all for sponsoring. Thank you.
Thank you. 